Thank you very much for joining this, this evening. Uh, I'm uh, Professor Luis Bernardino, and uh, I would like to uh, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. So our webinar is about the terrorism in Cabo Delgado, consequences for the security in Mozambique and beyond. And it's my pleasure to welcome you, everybody. Um, so the Global Strategic Platform would like to thank you, our partners. Uh, for this uh, session. This is our last session of the year, uh, namely for the CPLP Strategic Analysis Center in uh, Mozambique. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, I would like also to thank you the Center for International Relations Institute uh, at the Joaquin Chisan University. Thank you very much for being with us this, this evening. And also the Center for International Studies of the Lisbon University Institute. Thank you very much. Uh, the King's College from United Kingdom, thank you also very much. And uh, the Mikaelsen Institute from Norway, uh, thank you very much also for joining us. And also very special thanks for the uh, ISCS International Security Studies from uh, South Africa. So thank you very much for joining today. We're gonna have a very nice discussion and first, I would like to introduce our uh, to, uh, in, to our guest speaker. So, and begin uh, for the beginning of the section, we're going to have a, a very short introduction about Mozambique and about about uh, Cap Delgado. And for this, I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Anna Karina, for joining today. Is she is an independent consultant and a research researcher of uh, African peace and security. Is, she is a PhD, PhD, PhD student at the Lisbon University and also a senior associate in consulting on security and defense. Karina, thank you very much for joining today. And the second uh, speaker is, she is Sheila uh, Costa. She's from Mozambique. Uh, she's, she has a master in maritime security and safety for the Center of Strategic and International Studies of the Joaquin Shisan University in Maputo. Sheila, also thank you very much for you joining today. And ladies, the floor is yours. Uh, five minutes for introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Good evening. So um, the insurgency in the Northeast province of Cabo Delgado raised widespread national attention last March following the complex attack in the town of Palma and coast of Macumia. Um, and the roots and the cause of the conflict became the object of several studies and publications since, including of the genesis and development of what was, was known as the local Al-Shabaab, a group that integrates, at least formally, the Islamic State Central Africa province. This year also saw different international assistance mechanisms focusing on the security sector, being deployed by the regional and extra continental actors counterterrorism and insurgency by random forces, and later also by SADC standby force mission, SAMIM, in Mozambique, and capacity building to security forces via bilateral programs um, from the US, from Portugal, and also the newly established UCSCP mission in Mozambique, UTM Mozambique. After such as the EU are, are supporting also other actions, focusing on peace building, complete prevention, humanitarian relief, developed cooperation, but the role these and other actors play or could potentially play in cross-border governance issues, so beyond Mozambique, including the maritime dimension, requires further debate. Shayla, over to you. Good evening, everyone. It's a great opportunity to be here with you to speak about the consequences of terrorism in Mozambique, uh, in particularly to, to hear about this, the consequences for security. Uh, as much Karina was saying there is a maritime security dimension that can be called to speak about this threat in our country. It's important to see that while some actors try to establish a direct linkage between the terrorists in Cap Delgado and the maritime threats to security faced in Mozambique Channel, other actors call our attention to look to this 
streets and vulnerability has points that can be easily used by the terrorists. It's important to notice that in Mozambique Channel, and particularly in Mozambique maritime space, there are a range of vulnerabilities, such the absence of maritime boundaries, also weakness in maritime control, and other that have been used to promote uh, the emergence and also to support the proliferation of, of military and non-military threats to maritime security. It's important to see that those threats that we are seeing at sea and also the vulnerabilities can be uh, found or observed in land. And both, they are used to provide logistical support to these groups. In this sense, there is a great debate about the state options to deal with these threats for two reasons. In terms of actors, we got on one hand, the idea of self-help that is brought from the realistic school that demands from state a strong action. But it's important to consider that the terrorism is not a treat only for Mozambique security. It's also a treat for regional and global security. By this way, we have, on the other hand, the idea of security complex that is brought from the interdependence and also from the regionalism. This idea demands cooperation and also coordination among national, regional, and also global actors. In terms of strategy, we have also two uh, ideas or two central ideas. The first one is the tradition one, uh, the most popular that is called counterterrorism. This is characterized as a military response uh, that seeks to use the hard power to eliminate or to, to eliminate the group or to stop the military attacks. But the second one that we have, and on the other hand, is called the violent extremist prevention. This seeks to eliminate all the structural programs or all the vulnerabilities that can be used to promote the terrorism, to promote and also to support the terrorism. It's important to note that till this moment, Mozambique is trying to use a hybrid strategy, which is uh, characterized by a predominant uh, use of military, uh, predominant use of military uh, intervention with regional and global partners such SADC, Rwanda, European Union, private uh, security companies, and other. Those intervention brought to us expectations and opened a new panorama of security for Mozambique peace and also for the resolution of this conflict. But at the same time, the last uh, reports about new attacks in Yasa Pro in the Asa province, calling our attention to seek for new for, for new approaches and also to seek for new ways of understanding or for solution for this problem. Therefore, we are inviting our speakers and also our participants to seek to build new approaches or to consolidate the approaches that we have been researching, but also to look to the consequences in gender perspective, because we know that these three have social, military, and political consequences that can be felt in different ways from different people. Many thanks for your attention. Please, Mr. Benedino, you have the word. Sorry, a uh, little bit, a little problem. So we're gonna we're gonna kick off our our discussion. Thank you very much, Sheila and uh, Karina, for your very nice introduction. Uh, I'm more than happy to discuss with you later some of the conclusions, and maybe we we can have to to provide some more insights about this problem. And we're gonna have uh, three sorts of questions. We're gonna talk about the past, then we're gonna talk a little bit about the present, and then we're gonna see. What can we can we look for the future on the Cap Delgado problem in Mozambique? So, and for this uh, discussion, let me introduce our guests tonight. Uh, first is uh, Professor Alexandra Magnolia Dia. She is assistant professor at the Department of Political Studies of the Nova University of Lisbon. She is a researcher of the Portuguese Institute 
for international relations and that's a pleasure to have you tonight with us and uh, second guest Dr. Borges Namir is at the Center for Strategic and International of the Joaquin Shisano University and the researcher of the Security Studies. Thank you very much, Borges, for joining us. Uh, our next guest is Zlak. He is a senior researcher of the different uh, programs in Mozambique in the Michel in Norway. Uh, joining to, and our guest is Professor Vinícius Carvalho, is the director of the Institute in Department of War Studies in Rome. Vinícius, thank you for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to see you again. And the question goes to Alexander. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, what the main reason for escalation of the violence in Cap Delgado. From the point of view. Hello, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm joining you from Chile, Lisbon. I'm a regular uh, participant uh, as a listener in Africa session seminars. I've um, uh, participated as, a, as somebody with a very strong interest in the evolution of the Islam, militant Islamist insurgency in Northern Mozambique in a previous seminar. So I think um, it is very good to congratulate um, Africa Sessions for keeping the subjects alive and for highlighting indirectly that this is a very volatile, dynamic, evolving uh, situation. So in terms of um, the rise and the, the, the resilience of the militant Islamist movement in Northern Mozambique, if we look back into the causes of uh, the first attacks, uh, we have to, to look before uh, the first attacks uh, in October uh, 2017. And it's a very good point to start with the um, amazing scholarship, uh, let me put it that way, of Professor Liazat Bonat, who was here at Africa Sessions in a, a previous, um, in a previous uh, uh, session devoted to uh, Northern Mozambique province Cabo Delgado. And it's also important to highlight the contributions of Mozambican historian Yusuf Adam, because they have been engaging with this region uh, prior um, to the rise of the Islamist insurgency. So they can offer us a long-term perspective of the emergence of this uh, insurgency in northern Mozambique. Um, and the, the, the main uh, uh, starting point is to recognize there, there is no insurgency in Africa with a single uh, cause. So even if we start with the question of religion, and if we, can, if we must develop um, our analysis on the basis of a comparative perspective with, with what we have already learned about militant Islamist insurgencies in other regions uh, and in other subregions in Africa, in the Sahel, in the Horn of Africa, and uh, um, with uh, also Boko Haram, uh, what we can understand is that uh, the main driving factor that um, explains the, the recruitment of normally um, youth uh, groups to these movements, it's not necessarily uh, an ideological identification. Even, even as we, we learn from a massive um, exercise of interviews carried by the UNDP with former Al-Shabaab combatants from Somalia and from Boko Haram, um, normally those uh, young um, recruits that are more inclined to join these kinds of movements have an, a less 
a deeper knowledge of Islam and uh, uh, not as a, not um, a very uh, entrenched practice uh, of Islam. What we have witnessed and learned in the case of Mozambique is that a decade before the first uh, attacks in uh, 2017, uh, some uh, uh, groups in Mozambique have been benefiting from scholarships uh, to study uh, abroad. And when they came back, specifically to this region, uh, they introduced new practices. They would go into the mosque with their uh, shoes on. They reduced the number of prayers from five to three, and uh, they repudiated uh, a Western uh, a modern education on the basis that it suffered a Western influence. Recording and, in progress. And they were bent on um, advancing uh, um, uh, Sharia, uh, establishing Sharia. Uh, in uh, uh, their country. So this is part of the explanation. So there's, there's this first signs of a, a radicalization of uh, uh, an attempt to introduce new practices um, that contrasted and were resisted by uh, local Mozambiques, Mozambicans in the region. The first, the, the second uh, relationship, causal relationship that we have to bear in mind is the relationship between insurgency and land. With the massive discovery of uh, natural gas in the region, and even if we look at the first uh, uh, attacks and tactics, um, the, um, the, the value of the land in, his, in these areas skyrocketed, and uh, uh, the, the government carried an ad hoc po uh, policy of resettling um, uh, Mozambicans from this region with a very unfair, unjust indemnity in the order of 7.5 meticals. And this, of course, created uh, resentments. Um, in addition to this, um, uh, social inequalities uh, were on the rise. Um, and also this region within Mozambique has been characterized by um, a limited presence of state, state, uh, states, agents, and institutions. And it has also been characterized, or this um, limited presence of the state has been used by many of the local actors in order to carry illicit activities across the porous borders with the contiguous neighbor, Tanzania. Finally, uh, the matter of ethnicity. Um, normally, uh, um, uh, ethnic cleavages are explained as a source of additional grievance. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight is that uh, in this kind of context, what we learn from the situation and the resilience of al-Shabaab in Somalia, and uh, the same for Islamist militant uh, movements in the Sahel, is the volatility and the shifting pattern of alliances within the groups. And we have to highlight that access to the region has become more and more uh, constrained, limited, uh, just uh, to highlight that the kind of data that we are uh, gathering uh, is also uh, limited and the evolution of uh, ethnic identification is subordinated to other uh, grievances. The first response from the state, the Mozambican state, um, reacted to these developments. Um, uh, and uh, in the first moment, it had used private military companies from Wagner to the Dyke Advisory Group, and it still um, um, has recourse to a paramount private military company. And in, in a sense, the, 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 the response, the very muscular um, uh, response of the state uh, might have contributed to enhancing uh, the lack of trust between um, local Mozambicans from Cabo Delgado and the state. So in, uh, in trying to make sense of the trajectory uh, and the rise and resilience of this uh, insurgency, um, we have to look into multiple causes 
of, uh, of the, the, the conflict. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, Dr. Borges, what do you think about the main causes of this uh, insurgence in Cabo Delgado? The floor is yours. Well, good evening to everyone. Uh, this is a challenging question uh, uh, since we must assume that we have no enough information about what is happening in Cabo Delgado. So everything we'll say here is just about the rising hypothesis uh, based on the few information that we have got. Uh, first of all, the government of Mozambique prevented journalists and the researcher to go to Cabo Delgado when the conflict started. So it made it very difficult to, to us to get reliable and independent information. So everything we have got here, it comes whether from military source or from uh, local people uh, or even uh, you know from uh, aid workers who are based in that region. So the first um, uh, problem that we face here is the lack of accurate information. It makes it very difficult to us to say what are the root causes of the conflict, even though. Uh, we can uh, bring some points to debate. Uh, the main discussion is between the Islam, radical Islam and poverty in Cabo Delgado, uh, associated to the discovery of a mineral resource, uh, basically the rubies in the Monte West district, uh, the LNG in, in Palma, and also associated to the displacement of people uh, in front their lands to allow the multinational companies to build uh, investment, big investment project, basically the LNG facility plant. So let's uh, just take a quick examination to one of those hypotheses. If we look to the uh, radical Islam, uh, we cannot ignore it. I understand that people don't like to talk about it because this is very sensitive it touch our beliefs, uh, but we cannot ignore that Islam is being utilized either as driver or as a vehicle for recruitment of people. So those people who are attacking in the Cabo Delgado, the message that they spread is that we want to establish here a caliphate, we want to establish here a society based in Sharia. And we keep denying that, saying, no, 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 that's not true. But it's themselves who are saying, they are writing it. In Musimwa de Praia, uh, when it has been retaken by Rwandan Defense Force, all the messages that were there were not message about Jesus Christ, were message about Islam. But OK, I understand this is not comfortable to talk about, because this is sensitive. Uh, but also, uh, uh, I was like, uh, that I've interviewed some people who have been abducted and stayed with a insurgent for some months and then they have been released. And those people have told us, and uh, Joan Fejo was a friend of mine. Uh, I, I think all of you know, he has just published good reports on that. Those people tell us about how the indoctrination is going on there. The key message is based in religion. So we cannot ignore the role of a religion there. Uh, are those people fighting to save the religion? Maybe not, but religion is using to mobilize people to fight, to train people, uh, to give them a common goal to fight for. Uh, so this is a very important. Uh, should we blame Islam? No, of course but we should blame those who are utilizing, are wrongly using Islam to mobilize people to kill one each other. And this is interesting uh, that when those people uh, arrive in a village or somewhere else to attack, they shout Allah Akbar. Uh, they are not uh, shouting uh, Ave Maria or something else. Uh, so this is important to understand, to, to discuss it openly. If we want to to face the problem as it is. I understand this is a provocation, but it's something which uh, it's my conviction, so I shall talk about it. 
Uh, also, who is claiming the attacks? Who is claiming the attacks? So far, there is a single organization in the world claiming the attacks in the Cap de Gado and now in Nyasa. And this organization is called Islamic State Western Province of Africa or something like that. And this organization is worldwide uh, present in Maghreb, present in Sahel, present in uh, 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 all across, almost across the continent in Congo, but also uh, are present in, in Syria and, and Iraq. So uh, Islam is there. We may discuss how important it is, but it's there. But also the problem of the poor governance is there. You know, corruption. Uh, I, I just conducted some interview to people who have been uh, arrested and some of them have been convicted uh, to 40 years in prison, uh, 16 years in prison, accused of being part of the insurgent. All of them say something similar. When we arrested, police told us, if you have some money to give me, I can release you. If you don't have money, then I'm taking you to jail. All of them. So imagine how those people, how this affect people. He's just uh, arrested and kept in custody because he doesn't have money to pay to the police. So the, the problem of, of governance having in the center uh, the corruption is, is serious. As it contributed as well to the terrorists to cross the border from Tanzania to come to Mozambique, for example, without passport, without documentation. Because in Mozambique, you can travel just from Maputo to Cap Delgado without a single document, but driving as soon as you have got money in packet. So every police control where you arrive, you just give them some money and, and they let you go. So corruption is there as well. But also uh, those people have been uh, removed, forced to leave their, their lands in Cap Delgado uh, to allow uh, the multinational companies to build have facilities to LNG, they might have been, might have contributed to the conflict because those people were not happy in the way they've been displaced. They have been given money, but money is not enough to rural community. Uh, their livelihood is not money. Their livelihood came from the sea, which they could no longer have access to it to fish. We are talking about the fishermen who now have no access to the sea for fishing because Afunj Peninsula have been taken by first by Anadarko, have been taken by government to be given to Anadarko and now to Total. So there is, as uh, Professor Alexandra uh, wisely said, there will be a, a lot of reasons. But the key fact which I would like to bring here, and I think this is my thesis, is that the weakness of a political institution, including security institutions, is the main reason for the emergence of conflict. Because the latent conflict we always have got in capital guard, as we have it in Nyambane, we have it somewhere, we have it everywhere in Maputo. But with strong political institution, it could take to prevent the eruption of, of conflict, the emergence of the of conflict and escalation of violence. So government of Mozambique failed completely to prevent. And when conflict started, the response that was given, which was basically military-based response, instead of uh, controlling the situation, it fueled the problem. So government of Mozambique just deployed ill-trained police uh, to attack and arrest people in Musimbo de Praia instead of trying to understand the real cause of problem. So it fueled the conflict. And then we saw the situation uh, that we find us at this point, that we needed the rescue uh, from uh, Rwandan forces, uh, Samim forces, and also EUTM military, uh, EUTM Mozambique uh, training mission, which uh, are training in Mozambique and so on. So maybe I shall stop here. Uh, professor uh, on the root causes, uh, 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 assuming that I did not bring response to you, but just brought some elements to, to debate. Yeah, thank you very much, Boris, for your uh, assessment. Um, I remember that the chat is open, so if you want to put some questions, just uh, write on the chat, and I will try to bring it in the end to our guests. Um, so, Aslak, the same question for you. The floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bernardino. Um, and thank you very much for this uh, invitation to speak here tonight. Um, we, um, uh, I must say that we were lucky to meet and I got to know you uh, when we were in Vienna speaking about a similar subject a few, it seems like a few weeks ago, but it was uh, now it seems like ages ago because it was back in those times where we were actually meet, uh, able to travel and meet normally before we were sent back to our current state of uh, home offices. Uh, so maybe one day in the future, we'll be able to, to organize a proper conference again. Huh? Um, so uh, also, let me just start by saying thanks to the many international and Mozambican scholars with whom I've learned and been inspired. Um, um, apart from in me my meetings in my research in Mozambique and uh, also lately um, from reading and writing and discussions and so on. And I shall only mention those Mozambicans with whom I'm working on a recent research on, on our current research project, uh, also mentioned by uh, Alexandra. Uh, Lia Zat Bonate has been very important, Carmelisa Rosario um, and Joan Fejo at the uh, OMR in uh, Maputo, as well, of course, as uh, my friend Borges uh, Nyamete, who spoke just a, a while ago. So um, I will not attempt to uh, repeat all the very good and important points that uh, Borges brought up and uh, Alessandra also resumed very nicely some of the scholarship that has been published uh, and the results coming out of that about the work. So um, let me just say something quite short then. Um, here I would just start by emphasizing what I think can be summed up as the three Gs um, that have uh, to me serve as a sort of working hypothesis for understanding the roots of the war, which is the current questions you asked me about. And the three Gs are uh, God and grievance and greed. So let me quickly explain that the, the God part is of course uh, the reasons linked to religion and the mobilization of religious and, and of course um, Islamic groups. Um, as Borja said, let's not be afraid to say that it's, it's, it's Islam. Um, it, it, um, and of course, um, their uh, motives for mobilizing uh, against the state um, and how they use Islamic uh, narratives and Islamic tropes against the state. So that is the God part. And the second G is grievance. This is about uh, local perceptions of inequality and injustice. Um, but that is, I think it's important just to remark here that um, this injustice and in inequality is not uniformly felt by everyone in Cabo Delgado because there has been this sort of a, a, a narrative often repeated in uh, international media and so on that uh, one of the reasons for this war is that Cabo Delgado is a forgotten province, that it's very remote, that it's uh, sort of been poorly treated by the government uh, for a long time, or, you know, that it's um, forgotten in a way, uh, which is absolutely not the case. Uh, in, depending on one's perspective, it's not further, it's, it's not a more remote province than any other province uh, in the world. It's just it's where you are. And of course, uh, um, uh, Cabo Delgado is much closer to uh, many parts of the action in, um, in Africa, uh, in, in Eastern Africa, for instance, than, than, than is Maputo. Um, so, um, but, the, but I want, what I want to do is to draw attention to the internal conflicts that have been, that have historical roots that have been taking place within the populations of Cabo Delgado. There are, uh, yes, there are uh, religious uh, issues of grievance. Um, there are ethnic issues. Um, 
And uh, there are issues of grievance linked to the differences of occupation where people are in, in relation to the local economy. So these are, there are many conflict, many complex issues linked to the local um, cleavages um, in the political scene that are important to understand and study in order to get a good um, perspective. So uh, that was God and grievance. And I think that the last G is about greed. And I, of course, we've spoken a lot about the enormous boom in the extractive industries and the illicit trade, um, narcotics and smuggling of all sorts of different products that may have added uh, much fuel to the tensions and conflict um, in Cabo Delgado. Um, the greed is about how many politicians in Maputo, um, unscrupulous international companies and international organizations have uh, set their eyes on extractive uh, industries in, and Cabo Delgado's resources in order to extract them uh, in a very predatory way without uh, thinking about the local population or thinking about future development possibilities and the, the, um, the tracks that their activities leave in the local uh, political and economic uh, scene. Uh, so again, God, grievance, and greed. I think those are, uh, are good com concepts to think about, to summarize and think about uh, what is going on in um, um, Cabo Delgado. So uh, then I, I'd like, just like to take the opportunity to make one more point, um, that I'm profoundly convinced that this war is principally created by forces and contradictions emanating within Mozambique. It, it doesn't principally come from abroad. So therefore, to treat the insurgents as an extension of the Islamic State and as part of the global war on terror will lead to more conflict and less security. There are some um, journalists um, internationally who are making their names for uh, repeating the message over and over again that there, um, this is the Islamic State now spreading to uh, a new front and so on. And I think that is a false uh, perspective to take. But as Borges uh, says, and we may have differences of opinion or, or differences of um, perspective here, it is of course true that ISCAP um, uh, has claimed responsibility for what is going on there. Um, and is trying to take um, ownership of, of the conflict. Um, it may claim so, but my understanding of that, what is going on is that ISCAP or the uh, international Islamic State works more as a franchise. Um, you know, if you wanted to send up, sell uh, franchise, meaning that if you want to sell hamburgers in Maputo, um, Maybe a, a, an initial smart idea may be that you, you brand the name of your burger selling shop, uh, McDonald's, thinking that that may attract um, customers and um, yeah, attention, um, starting from the idea that all attention is good attention. But um, in fact, if we bring that back to the franchise of the Islamic State, we do not know exactly how much their support means, how much logistics or money or weapons they spread and they actually contribute with in Mozambique, neither how much uh, this um, link to the international Islamic State actually motivates young Mozambicans to join the insurgency. This, as Borges said very well, there's so much we don't know yet um, because the sources of information are so uh, scarce. So with those words, um, I'll save my time. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you very much, Aslak, for your point of view. I also think there are some fake news going around and some of these fake news are deeply uh, putting our mind and our understanding about this problem a little bit uh, not completely understandable. Um, so Vinicius, uh, what is your point of view? 
Thank you very much, uh, Bernardino, for inviting me to take part of this panel here. Um, first of all, um, I would like to start with excuses. What's never a very good thing when we are talking publicly is the worst thing that we could do uh, in, in a rhetoric perspective. But um, I would to excuse saying that I am not an expert in Mozambique. Um, I actually went to, to Maputo, Mozambique, uh, for the first time last November. Um, I am, however, a Brazilianist. Um, and I am also um, an analyst of security issues around the world. So I'm following up that very quickly and very um, closely, especially what's going on in, in the Cabo Delgado region. So I start with this excuse and I start also saying that I will not have the same level of sophistication of analysis that my colleagues that precede me had. What I will try to do is to act as an analyst here. And I will do two things, basically. I will zoom in and zoom out this Cabo Delgado region and trying to, to configure how I see the situation in these two perspectives, in this zoom in and zoom out. And I will start with the zoom out. I think um, we need to look at the situation in Cabo Delgado as very similar to many other parts of the world today. Uh, a reflect of a configuration of states and state failures and lack of, um, uh, of local participation in, in political decisions in concentration of powers in, in hands of very small groups of people that make decisions um, for, for large parts of areas, sometimes without local ownership, sometimes and most of the time, I would say, uh, without even local participation in democratic terms of that, even if we, we can discuss if what means with democracy, we don't have time for that here, but I, I am bringing again this aspect of the local participation here. We are seeing this sort of a repetition of certain frames that our colleagues brought here, the questions of poverty, the questions of local participation in decision-making processes, the, pros the, the, the question of uh, radicalization in, in several religious groups, and that configurates in one aspect in Cabo Delgado region, but it can happen in many other aspects all over the world. Look at India, for instance. So uh, if we zoom out that, we can see a sort of zeitgeist and Cabo Delgado conflict fitting very well in many other um, uh, frame that we could do in the world uh, right now. If we zoom in, however, we could perhaps say some words. And again, here I am being a very modest contributor to this analysis. And I would reinforce especially the question of the local leadership, the question of how to make in every big country in the world, and Mozambique is a big country, how to make a participatory government, how to make a government that will really implement uh, policies that will shift patterns of inequalities that have been in place uh, historically, colonially and post-colonially speaking. So um, this, these aspects in the zooming aspect uh, probably uh, would be very important to be looking at as well. Uh, for any conflict in the world, we can try to find a very simple and punct or a, a exactly moment where we can say that's where it started. All conflicts start results of several, uh, several phenomena that run around without solution until the moment that these frictions became a fracture and until the moment that this fracture became a conflict that we cannot have control over that as well. And what probably is the failure of the Mozambique state in this point or Mozambique authority in this point. And again, what I'm saying is probably I'm not giving recipes. I'm not saying that I know the answers for that. If I knew, I would be not here talking to you, but probably in another position now. But um, what I'm saying is that um, probably the most big mistake that drove the conflict arrive into what is today is the understanding of security. What we understand as security today, what we are applying as a response for those frictions that became fractures, that became conflicts? Are we using the response of securitization in the terms that some colleagues mentioned before, simply send military response, hard, um, uh, hard response in order to suffocate any sort of um, uh, um, protest or even sublevation? Are we thinking about security in a more broader sense 
and understand that will only be possible security with a certain level of equality. And I will not use the word development deliberated here because I am critical of that in many terms, but in, in terms of equality and in terms of local participation and ownership and leadership in the decision-making processes of uh, self-governance of the regions. So that's one important point that we should bring here. Uh, I think I will stop at this point and let's go to the next question because I think we can develop more these ideas uh, further on. Thank you very much again. Yes, thank you very much for your point of view. Um, and thank you very much all for this uh, overview about the past. Um, so my proposal now is that we jump a little bit and let's talk about the present. Uh, and about the present, my question to all of us is, um, what is the real impact of the regional and the national security uh, of this conflict in Cabo Delgado? Um, what what is what is the what is the the next? What well, how do you see this conflict? And um, if do if you think that this is going to be a spillover effect on the region, or this is going to be uh, something different? Um, and again, I will call you, Alexandra. Uh, please let me see what is po what your point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would like to speak maybe of ramifications of the conflict. So when the insurgency started uh, um, the, in um, Cabo Delgado, one might ask, why didn't it happen in uh, Nampula, where you have a, a large majority of Mozambicans who identify um, with Islam in uh, an average of uh, 70%, whereas in Cabo Delgado, 58%. So I would like in the same line as my uh, panel colleague, Aslak mentioned, to highlight the internal or domestic um, dimension of the conflict. So we have to look within and we have to start with the ramifications of what's going on for the contiguous provinces in Mozambique, and we already see um, the ramifications for Nyasa, not only in terms of attacks and extension, expansion of um, the insurgency's um, uh, influence. We should also uh, bear in mind the internally um, uh, movements, the internally displaced people, um, which are creating a further strain in already very vulnerable um, uh, communities. Uh, in terms of um, international ramifications at the regional level, it's no coincidence that uh, uh, Luis Bernardino and myself, this week, we were in a VIVA, in a PhD defense, on the partnership between the African Union and um, the uh, United Nations. And we were looking into AMISOM. And the research findings were uh, fascinating in a sense, but also worrisome. And one of the main uh, conclusions from this study uh, carried by uh, Miguel Aju was that uh, the involvement of frontline states, meaning contiguous neighboring countries, in uh, peacekeeping missions uh, um, carried by uh, regional organizations as SADC pose the dangers because um, these countries are more likely to pursue their own uh, national interests and agendas. So we have to be vigilant in terms of the, the foreign policies orientations of each of the troop contributing countries. Um, and also, as we are speaking of a province where illicit activities tend to flourish, as we have um, learned about the criminalization of the Mozambican state, uh, we also have to remain vigilant in terms of the, the, the temptation for those involved in fighting the Islamist insurgency and providing security for the civilians in becoming engaged in these same illicit commercial activities. So this is the lesson that we learned, Bernardino, Luis Bernardino and myself from the very fascinating findings of um, 
Amis, the complexities of Amisom and Somalia. So individual uh, peacekeepers might be tempted uh, to engage in this kind of uh, activities. Uh, and um, just uh, to, to highlight again another point that uh, is a matter of great concern is um, a trend in other conflicts for the proliferation of self-defense militias. And if we have a proliferation of non-state armed actors in these um, uh, conflicts, it will further complicate um, and escalate uh, the, the, the drivers of violence and conflict and uh, insecurity. So these were my main concerns. And of course, for all of us who have been studying conflicts in Africa, even if the conflict is um, internally driven, uh, the regional ramifications are expected through refugees movements, through the facility and the porosity of border that allows uh, other, uh, other um, um, identical um, Islamist insurgents to uh, come into Mozambique. So far, in other countries, what we have observed was an internationalization of the conflict with attacks in uh, the troop contributing countries. So in the case of Somalia, Al-Shabaab perpetrated attacks in Kampala, Uganda, and also in Nairobi, in the capital of Kenya, and in the Northeast District. We haven't witnessed this in the case of Mozambique uh, yet. Thank you. Uh, I'll pass it. Uh, thank you very much, Alexander, for your comments. Uh, Professor Borges, how do you see this real impact in the national and regional security of the conflict in Cabo Delgado? Oh, well, uh, thank you again. Uh, maybe before answering your question, just uh, bringing a little bit more debate on the role of Islamic states in, in, in the Cabo Delgado conflict. Um, I insist that we should take it seriously uh, because just let me just pick the example brought by my friend uh, Aslak, uh, who is someone who I like him too much. But when we're talking about franchising, uh, I don't think McDonald's just giving a brand to the burger shop in Maputo. They give the brand, but also they give them the expertise on how to make the same, the same burger we have got in, in New York. So why should we think uh, Islamic States is just giving their brand, to, brand to, 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 to their Mozambican allies here, not, uh, not, not including the expertise on how to make it, how to carry out sophisticated attacks. So uh, uh, I'm happy that the, uh, a good part of us here have been following the conflict from the beginning. And those guys, in the beginning, they had into weapons. They were used to be called the machinellos because they used it. Okay. Borsh, um, let's, okay, let's, let's do that way. Let's, let's move to Aslak uh, with the same question, the same point of view, and then we will come to you again, okay? Um, Okay, so Azla, can you comment on that, please? Um, online. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry that we lost uh, Bosch's sound here because uh, he was developing a really interesting argument and debate uh, about the role of the Islamic State. Um, I I didn't hear the end of it, so I'm not sure how to to uh, to deal with that. So maybe we can get uh, maybe we can pick up that debate later. Um, yeah, um, so um, I certainly don't disagree that, uh, I, I, I think I totally agree actually, we need to take this seriously, of course we do. Um, but um, we can, so it's possible that they are developing uh, organization logistics and, and uh, that the Islamic State is, are teaching them how to make those burgers, etc. Um, but I'm also quite sure that uh, the Islamic State is a very uh, local Middle Eastern organization. It, it grew out of the Middle East uh, of, um, and uh, the dynamics that 
that created the organization and the possibility of that organization there are incredibly different from, from the local situation in Mozambique. So um, I think um, that uh, there are limits to copying um, the that 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 movement um, in in Mozambique. But of course, that is also uh, kicking in open doors for for Borges. So, but I, I agree, we should study study that. Can I just, uh, since the part of your question, uh, Luis, was about uh, the international enterprises on um, the, the, fact, the impact of this, the, the, the conflict for the future of international enterprises in Mozambique. So um, I, I, I jotted down some points to answer exactly that question. Um, so if you allow me to develop that. Yeah. So. Um, when the insurgents attacked Palma in March, um, everyone thought it completely changed the situation for regional security and, and international business in Cabo Delgado. Um, that is only partly true, and it is, certainly didn't change everything for every international business in the same way. Some may have lost, but some or many surely gained. And I think that's important uh, that we just don't think that, oh, war is bad for business and now the place cannot uh, have an economy and so on. That's, that's not uh, the case. It may not have the economy that we want to see, but it's certainly there's a lot of money going into that place now. And, and that creates business for some people. Uh, so why do I say this? The, the concept of international enterprises is a really mixed bag and we need to break it down. The only thing that really gets attention on a global scale is the offshore gas industry with Total, Eni and Exxon leading their respective consortia of energy companies in the gas industry. So on the one hand, the intensified attacks probably reinforced uh, any doubts that these companies had about the giant investments in the offshore gas. And they had many doubts, partly due to the situation on the international gas market, which has nothing, nothing to do with the conflict in Mozambique. But none of these large global giants are very, are, are averse to operating in highly volatile and violent contexts. You know, these industries are so profitable that they can, uh, they can to a certain degree buy their own security, uh, despite the enormous suffering of the local uh, population. You know, as we have seen in Mozambique, they can also attract the security by the political mobilization of international armies, such as with the Rwandese intervention um, in uh, Mozambique. In all likelihood, it is paid for by France, um, and which in all likelihood has the principal objective of securing the gas installations uh, pertaining to Total uh, in the area around Palma. Uh, at least that's my impression of the actual operations of the Rwandese that they are focusing on securing those, those areas around the gas installations. So the, the, but the gas industry is just one part of international enterprise in Cabo Delgado. There are also the multinational comp companies operating in the onshore extractive industries such as the Montepuesh uh, Mont Ruby mining. And they are in business with important politicians in Maputo. Uh, they apparently remain profitable despite the war, uh, partly through mobilizing their own security, buying off insurgent attacks, and partly by mobilizing national security forces to their own personal and private advantage. Um, so the same schemes probably count for the Chinese, the Turkish, and other foreign businesses that operate in timber, exotic fauna, and extractives uh, of minerals. And uh, so these companies, international companies, are used to thriving in the illicit or semi-illicit existence in business with the national elite. Um, I don't think there are many Swedish or Finland uh, companies there, but there are certain uh, other companies which are much more used to operating in this kind of environments. And some of them will suffer from the insecurity, but others may actually thrive since war and militarization means more opportunities for corruption and predatory extraction in, um, in, um, in cahoots with the elite in the capital. 
Um, and for instance, just take the example of timber uh, smuggling uh, in a large scale uh, carried out by Chinese companies, apparently continuing as, as never before. At least that's, that's the information I have. Uh, uh, and finally, and when talking about international businesses, we should not forget that also war is business. So we should not forget that uh, the international security enterprises ranging from pure mercenaries such as Van Dyck and Wagner to global security giants uh, Garda World, uh, which is now in a business relationship with the Mozambican company Sakudimba, owned by uh, the Chapanda family. These business interests, uh, uh, yeah, and also let me add the business interests of the Privinvest groups, which we know very well from the hidden debt scandals. Um, they are surely lurking in the military logistics sector developing in, in Cabo Delgado. Um, all these businesses also will thrive in wartime as long as they can secure the current political regime in Maputo and ensure the safety of the most important cities in Cabo Delgado. So I think that these things, they drive securitization around the cities of Cabo Delgado to the detriment of the wider security of the rural hinterland, uh, because it drives their, their priorities in that, in that sense. So the foreign companies operating um, in a much smaller scale in, for instance, agriculture, as well as many companies investing in tourism in Cabo Delgado, they are probably the, the businesses that are suffering most due to insecurity. So what I wanted here is to, uh, yeah, uh, is to break down the concept of uh, business. And, 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 and finally, if you add to that the smuggling industry, industry and so on, then, and you've count that as an international business as well, you, you really start to see the diversity of what it, international business really means. And that if you, once you do that, um, you understand that the tourism may go down, but business may be, may, may be thri thriving. It's the militarization of the province actually is fully compatible with many international businesses, but some traditional and more traditional businesses associated with normal capitalist development are surely suffering. So those were my points. Uh, yes, Aslak, thank you very much for your comment. A very complex situation indeed. Uh, Borges, uh, do you mind to keep your uh, discussion about the franchising, please? The floor is yours. Okay, now I hope you can hear me now. Um, so I've just found a way to continue in this interesting debate. So I'm going through my phone now. So hopefully uh, the, my voice is, is very hearing very well there. Okay, so uh, thank you. I will skip the franchising, but what I was trying to say is that we have, we have different uh, attacks in the capital Gado. One before the group uh, pledged uh, allegiance to Islamic State and one after. So before that, that was a, a weaker group attacking remote, remote villages. And once they've been allowed to enter to this franchise, then they grow bolder, sophisticated attacks, and then started to have uh, this, you know, uh, show off attacking capital districts, uh, so on, so on. And also, the Islamic State claim attacks in real time as the attack is happening. So why we believe that they have a communication with the group so that they can claim the attack in the real time, but they don't have bring nothing to the group, even strategy, even training. So, well, I leave this for discussion, uh, for future discussion and for further reflection and for the purpose that we all were writing. But regarding the security of the country and the region, uh, first of all, I'm part of those who look to security, having the uh, people as the reference of its security. So on that, I think the impact is so bad. We have uh, almost a million of people have been affected by, by, by this insurgency. So people are suffering in Cap Delgado, in IDP centers, but not only in Cap Delgado. Now it's Cap Delgado, Niasa, Nampula, and the north of Tanzania, uh, south of Tanzania. So the impact of this conflict uh, to the people uh, is so huge. Uh, it's so huge. And sometimes we ignore that. 
we forget that. We start to think about total, we start to think about uh, uh, big companies uh, that may stay in Cap del Gado, but may leave. But then on the other hand, we have local people who have no choice, who have no place to go. Or they stay in Cap del Gado, or they stay in Cap del Gado. So for those people who are dying, would they lost their homes, would they lost their properties, those are the ones highly affected by these studies. Uh, regionally, I think, uh, uh, look, uh, everywhere where we have got this kind of violent extremists in, in Africa, we have something specific, which is the majority of Muslim uh, population, including Cap Delgado. So Professor Alexandra was asking, ah, the majority of uh, Islam uh, uh, community in Mozambique is based in Nampula. Yes, it's based in Nampula. But if we look to where the conflict started in Cap Delgado, that's Musimba the Praia, that's Palma. In that, in that district, 99% of population are, 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 are Muslim, if I'm not wrong. But at least 98% are, are Muslim. So the conflict did not start in Shiwure, did not start in Balama for some reason, which I don't want to repeat here to discuss. So I don't see how the conflict can expand, for example, to countries where we don't have a, a majority of Muslim population in the region. What might happen is something like what happened in Uganda a couple of months ago, so that uh, some uh, radical people might attack some facility, government facility, or carry out bomb attacks in South Africa, for example, because South Africa is supporting uh, Mozambique, might do the same in Rwanda, for example, might do the same in Lesotho or Botswana or even Angola. So all those countries which are supporting uh, government of Mozambique with the so-called crusades by the attackers. So, uh, and we have always, already uh, uh, here Islamic State threatening uh, to attack South Africa because South Africa was supporting Mozambique. So this is something that we can uh, see in, in the region. Uh, but also, I think, uh, I agree with Aslak, basically that Tota will not stop to operate, will not stop the operation because of the attack. They might, they might build a kind of green zone uh, you know, the green zone from Iraq in that area. And I think that's the reason Rwandese are in Cap Delgado, just to create this green zone, which is the uh, LNG influence perimeter that Musimba, the Praia, and the Palma. So let's see what happens. If the conflict continues in, in, in Niasa, we won't see Rwandese going into Niasa. They will stay in Cap Delgado. So Sadek will go to Niasa to support because Sadek are there for the region. But also Malawi is uh, under threat because we have uh, uh, some kind of radicalism already. We have a, a, a large community of Muslim there. And with the move to Niasa, uh, we know Niasa share border with, Tanz with, with Malawi. So Malawi, and just like Tanzania, may face uh, this kind of problem as well, including Kenya, for example. We, that's why Kenyans have sent to Mozambique now a contingent of military to train a Mozambican military because they need to get information as well. So that is the, 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 the current situation. And unfortunately, I'm part of those who think this conflict will not end in the next year. We might see it for the next uh, five or even 10 years uh, because this is how they, they act. They just arrive, but they never go. Yeah, Borsch, very good comments. Uh, before jumping to Vinicius, let me just one question for you. What about Tanzania? What is the role of Tanzania in this conflict? Just two minutes, please. Uh, we have two Tanzanias here. We have Tanzania with President. We had Tanzania with President Magufuli, and the current Tanzania with President, uh, the new President Sulul. I think that's the name. So Tanzania with President Magufuli, their role was so poor because Tanzania was angry with Mozambique because Mozambique decided to go forward with the LNG project, while Tanzania was, uh, you know, calling for better condition for African countries. So the relationship between Mozambique and Tanzania became so poor, 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 while we are natural allies. So that was Tanzania with President Magufuli. Then, uh, unfortunately, President Magufuli died, and the current president, she looks like she's having a different approach. She is now, she is now patrolling the southern border of, of, of Tanzania. Uh, she has now sent the uh, highest contingent 
of a military to Mozambique under the Samim uh, uh, deployment. And so now we have a different Tanzania who is much cooperative, uh, who is much uh, helpful uh, supporting Mozambique fighting the, the insurgents. So that's my direct answer. Yeah, thank you very much, Borj, on this comment. And Vinicius, what is your point of view on the regional security, on the conflict? Thanks again. It's so difficult to talk about uh, about that, especially after my colleagues. Again, no, it's you are putting me in a very difficult situation here, Ben Ajin, because I'm always the last to talk after my colleagues have already brought quite a lot of points. Um, I may dis disagree with many of the points that we have heard here, but we have no time to discuss that. And especially about the question of focusing on specific elements as causes for conflicts, and especially looking at what is seen here, a conflict that has been growing systemically. And as Borges, Borges said, we'll not finish next year. We'll continue because again, we probably are addressing this issue, trying to find one point to touch and solve the conflict, and that will be not one single point. That's also because no conflicts today in this world, they probably are not global as we had in global conflicts like World War II, but they are all international in our aspects. As Lack mentioned, many aspects here, especially the, the commercial ones. Um, uh, and I would like to, to, to drive then my, my talk on one specific point that we didn't talk here at all. It was the maritime security of, of this, this side here, or the maritime dimension of it. So uh, the, the canal of Mozambique, it's a very important uh, maritime route, globally speaking today. We saw the, the importance of this canal much more evident evident after what we happened in the Suez Canal last year when when one ship blocked the canal and suddenly all the maritime traffic needs to find an alternative way and Canal de Mozambique became a good alternative for that. Um, we are also talking about one important maritime a route for international drug trafficking. That's a big business, internationally speaking. It's a business that has, and that Brazilians, we, uh, that is a comfortable zone for me because Brazilian international trafficking goes to Mozambique as well. And very recently, uh, 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 drug, tra drug dealers from Brazil were arrested in Mozambique and also Mozambicans in Brazil because of this international chain of drug trafficking that benefits a lot of international conflict and especially uh, if we if we see some waters that are not uh, uh, securely uh, protected. So uh, the maritime aspect of this this situation in, in, in Mocimbo da Praia and Palma and Cabo Delgado in general, but let's put that in the Mozambican uh, international, uh, in the Mozambican waters, uh, plays a very important role internationally and regionally speaking as well. In maritime security terms, we haven't seen yet uh, actions of piracy as we have seen in, in the north part uh, of the continent, uh, in the Horn of Africa, for instance. But um, can we be sure that the next step, Borges, will be not something going in this direction? Um, are we are we really prepared to respond to that also, not only militarily, but also understanding the dynamics of that for uh, for the population in land? <clears throat> Another important element that we haven't discussed so much, someone of you mentioned that, but it's also an international impact, is the question of fishing, the international fishing happening in this uh, in these waters. We see many many um, um, big powers today, really proceeding with predatory fishing around the world. How is that playing uh, an, a role or an impact on the security of the region as well? So what I want to see and summarize and to conclude here is, besides all the elements that my, my colleagues uh, said before here on the land aspect of this international, regional, and more globally uh, impacts of this conflict, we have a maritime side that we cannot neglect at all because that plays a very important role in the regional, but also the global security terms, and especially with the uh, international drug trafficking and international, um, uh, um, in general, um, trafficking of, of goods, and the, local, the impact in local population, especially in the fishing communities, and also in the transport through the sea, and the risk of this escalating of this conflict to piracy that we haven't seen yet in the region. So I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Vinicius. I also agreed that the, there's an impact on land. There's, of course, 
uh, impact on the sea. And then we have to we have to combine both things, and we have to have an overview about the conflict regionally and, of course, internationally. Um, well, uh, Shayla, uh, you are expert on maritime security. Uh, do you have two minutes? Do you want to say something about this before jumping to the next question? The floor is yours, if you like. This is a provocative question. Hi. Uh, yes. Well, uh, I agree with the things that my colleagues said after, uh, said after, and I believe that indeed there are many threats that can be explored in our um, Mozambique channel uh, to promote the terrorism has a. Uh, to promote the terrorism as a logistical support to these uh, to, to the attacks. But the interesting thing that we must uh, have in mind is that um, the vulnerabilities that we face in sea, we also have in land. We can speak only about uh, the absence of maritime boundaries without uh, remember that even in land, there are space that we don't have borders. So by this way, it's important to consider that there are threats that that uh, there are threats that can be explored that are not only those threats that are responsible for the terrorism, but they can impact negatively for the security in general. And thanks. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, we talk about the past, the present, and let's now bring the crystal ball and think about the future. And uh, so how do you see the, the next move? How do you, what is the next step on the Cabo Delgado conflict? Um, how do you see this problem? What is the solution or, or is any solution for this problem? And now, now give the floor to Alexandra, um, three minutes, please. Can you listen to me? Sorry. Yes, now, yes. now it's okay. Okay, I'm going to be extremely brief. I cannot uh, see you. Okay, I can see you again. I'm going to focus on uh, three uh, uh, aspects to bear in mind. And uh, building on what Borges mentioned, which is the reference of security. Uh, that is the, the, the human, the individual, the civilians, those affected by the conflict. And I would start with the question of trust. Do the Mozambicans affected by the conflict trust those that are there to protect them from the advances of the Islamist insurgency? So this is one of the key areas to keep our focus on. Uh, secondly, not only uh, do the civilians uh, are the civilians able to trust again in uh, the Mozambican security forces? And we have learned how this trust has been deteriorated, undermined by the same um, uh, response that the, the, the state has been following um, to uh, mitigate, to counter the advances of the insurgency. Secondly, with the presence of troop contributing countries within the SADC uh, mission, um, what is the level, what is the degree of trust between the Mozambican security forces and these uh, external forces that are fighting alongside um, the Mozambican defense forces in order to curb the advance of uh, the insurgency? And uh, finally, uh, the question of credibility. The question of credibility is related to matters that uh, Borges referred, Aslak referred before, uh, which is the matter of poor uh, governance. So we have uh, to um, bear in mind, if all this training that uh, the security institutions within Mozambique, uh, namely uh, the, the defense forces, will undergo at the bilateral level and with the EU training mission, uh, will lead 
to more responsible, more accountable ways of carrying a counterinsurgency, which is not have been the case so far. So credibility also in terms of those that are there to protect the civilians. Uh, and what we learned from other contexts of conflict is that um, those uh, integrating um, uh, peace, peacekeeping missions um, also uh, tend to engage in um, um, human rights violations. So this is a, a further question uh, to follow and to remain vigilant. In terms of my final remark and concern, and this is shared, I believe, by most of those that study the conflict, um, a, a military-based uh, response will not solve the problem. As Borges mentioned, this conflict is likely to last, as we can learn from the resilience of al-Shabaab in Somalia. So we need a, a holistic approach in order to mitigate the movement's ability to recruit further uh, civilians within um, Mozambique. And I will finish uh, with this point and I'm looking forward for the audience's questions. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Alexander, for your comments. I also agreed that we have to have an overall solution and in a medium long term, which is also that, that it takes a long time. Uh, Borges, what is your comment uh, about the future of this conflict? Well, um, I agree with Alexander. At least I have said everything which I was uh, thinking about. So I think uh, we need to combine two um, responses in the Cap Delgado. Actually, not in the Cap Delgado, but all the northern region of Mozambique. So we need to combine uh, military operations. Uh, military operations are, are fundamental. Are important because overall this is a security problem. There are people killing other people, uh, burn, beheading, uh, 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 burning houses. So we need uh, well-trained military. We need good intelligence. Uh, we need well-disciplined militaries on the ground. So th that is important in one hand. In another hand, we need what is so-called CVE counter violence extremist measure, which are very important. Uh, we need to train local people. We need to give local people hope so that they find a reason not to join the insurgents. We need to give them job. Finally, the government of Mozambique will have to invest in the local people, which never happened. Because the Maputo's elite uh, use it just to get the resource from the people and bring it to Maputo to enjoy and even take it abroad to Europe, to somewhere else to enjoy. So now, if the Maputo elite want to end this conflict, it must start to invest to local people, no longer going to Cap Delgado to take rubies by Mr. Shipande and sell it in Singapore and take the money and enjoy in Miami no longer doing that. The money from rupees in Cap Delgado might be invested in Cap Delgado so that local people in Cap Delgado might find no reason to join the insurgents. That is key. That's fundamental. If people have no job, then they will be vulnerable to be recruited and attack their own community. So I think this is the future. We know what to do. I believe someone from government is listening to us. I hope so. And they are reading books. They are reading good research that are everywhere about it. So they have just to do that. Investing in local people. That is key in education, providing them skills so that they can find job. And then the problem will be solved, not tomorrow, not next year, in short, long term, but it will be solved because no one will be happy to be recruited to kill other people. These people have future, have hope in future and know what he will do tomorrow. He knows what he, it will fit his own people tomorrow. So those people will not fight against their own state if the state is supporting them. So that's the, the future of the conflict. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Borg, for your uh, uh, your answer. I believe no, hope. Hope is the question, and uh, I also believe that your reports, your very good reports, are are putting the the finger on the problem, and we want you to keep writing these reports because it's very important. So, congratulations for that, uh, Azlak. What is your point of view? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, to the first question, it's, it's actually a yes or no question. Do you consider that the urgent involvement of the international community is the only way to resolve this conflict? And um, you may be surprised to hear that, uh, no, I don't think the urgent involvement uh, is the only way to resolve this conflict. Um, it may be part of the solution, but um, uh, it may also quickly become part of the problem. Um, and so there has to be a political and civil solution as well. And I'll spoke, spoke, speak to that in a little while, but uh, we know, uh, first I wanted to say that we know from many similar interventions that often the international troops uh, become part of the problem as much as they become part of the solution. Um, and uh, what do we do, for instance, in a situation where, which could be ver maybe a realistic scenario in a very short uh, future from now, uh, when SADC soldiers um, who are not being paid um, are being regularly part of the local economy of smuggling, uh, resource extraction, mineral extraction, they're being inv involved in the um, smuggling of people uh, involved in the prostitution industry and drug smuggling, etc. Et you know, uh, if you have uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of poorly paid soldiers in a setting like uh, Cabo Delgado, that's the next thing I will expect will happen, that these will get involved in the illicit economy uh, quite soon. Um, and then therefore also part of the problem. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know this, but this sort of, it's my warning, this may happen. Um, in what way then should the international troops uh, intervene? I think that the reality is that the Mozambican government will invite uh, whoever they see best fit with its current interests, um, like it did when it, when Yusuf uh, insisted on first inviting the Rwandese before he allowed the SADC to enter the country. And the way I analyze the political economy of Mozambique today, um, the interests of the power holders in Maputo are first and foremost linked to the short-term considerations such as uh, how to stabilize the current regime and how it will uh, survive the next electoral cycle. Um, you know, who will be the president after 2024 and which relations will he have with businesses in Cabo Delgado and other uh, crucial industries in Mozambique. So part of their thinking of these politicians who actually make the decisions about who, which international troops will be there, part of the thinking may be about ex promoting exactly peace and development and to undercut or pacifying the insurgents in Cabo Delgado, that is fighting uh, the insurgency and terrorism. But they may also be overtaken by the impulse to use international companies, international military forces, and even to manipulate the military actions of the insurgents themselves in order to secure their short-term political interests such as in the next elections coming up. Even, uh, and that's important, even if that is detrimental to the overall security of the entire population in, in, in uh, Cabo Delgado, you know, the, 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 the masses of poor people, basically. So um, then I think uh, there is no singular, military or civil solution when things have gotten as far as it has. So yeah, I, I agree with Borges that uh, there must be some kind of military response. Um, I don't disagree with that. 
but I think that our in, in our current thinking at the moment, we also need to focus a lot on the political and civilian approach, without which the military intervention is going to be meaningless. Uh, and, and I just noted down two points. Uh, we have to listen to the insurgents and what they have to say. That is difficult. These are, uh, uh, you know, really, you know, unruly people with really weird ideas. Um, but they are people with faces, and it it must be at some point uh, a solution must be must be noted. Uh, must be connected to talking to them uh, in some way. Uh, the second point, and more importantly, perhaps, is to try to resolve through a development plan that is credible to the populations of um, Cabo Delgado, in particular, uh, the youth. And that means real development, which means real jobs and real investments. And uh, I think also, as Borges said, not more opportunities for corruption because we have so much history of that uh, you know large development plans coming in supported by the world bank and and so on and it all ends up being funds which are siphoned off somehow uh, to um, to the uh, to the elites um, very far away from Cabo Delgado uh, so those were my point, points that we need a, milita uh, a military response, but also focus a lot on the political and civil, uh, civilian approach. Um, then there was some questions in the chat session here, and I have to admit that I was, uh, I find myself uh, completely unable to respond to the questions and write um, and pay attention to what was being said at the same time. So I ask uh, for pardon for that. Uh, one of the qu interesting uh, questions was, can ISIS spread to other provinces? So someone, el someone else may pick up that. Yeah, uh, Azlak, thank you for your comments, uh, your overview. Uh, I agreed in the most of your comments. Uh, let's uh, kick off the ball for Professor Vinicius. You are always the last one, but um, please, your comment on that, sorry. Thank you very much again, uh, Bernardino. Um, I will be a little bit more provocative now. And I think um, sometimes, especially when we talk about future, that is exactly the moment that even analysts, we tend to be too much um, idealistics. And we tend to forget some practical questions that are disturbing, but we need to put. The first thing I think we need to answer clearly about the situation in Cabo Delgado, as well as many other conflicts in the world, but in this specifically, is that a problem of defense or a problem of security? If we don't make this distinction here, we cannot move forward. Are we treating that as a defense issue or a security issue? We need to talk about security. We need to talk about defense. We need to talk about the nexus between these two things today. Because if we don't do that, we'll be thinking, okay, we need mili strong military response, fantastically. That is a classical defense response. So do we need military response or do we need security response? Those two things are different. Despite the nexus that they have, despite that the complexity of conflicts today that are really showing more and more the evidence of some synergy among those, uh, those two elements, they are not the same thing. And if we don't make this distinction, we will be treating a code uh, that's caused by a virus with, with antibiotics. And that probably can address some symptoms, but the causes are, will be there still. So we need to be careful about that. The second aspect that I want to mention here is another realistic question. We talk about solution, but what is a solution? What to really call a solution for a conflict like that? Are we being realistically uh, addressing the question and how can a government or a state or a community or an international community respond for such a complex dynamic uh, conflict like this one? How many actors need, need to be involved to really be a realistic solution for this conflict? And again, uh, it's not that I'm defending a sort of realistic approach here in, in IR, but I'm just saying that if we lack the answer for these questions, we will come with beautiful practical speeds of solutions, but will not come really with any proposal of solution. Because there is a lot of problems in defining terms 
And what do we mean with that? And my colleagues here, they use two terms that I want to highlight and they say that if we don't have clar a clarification about those, we will be saying this in 10 years again about the same conflict or a, a more increasing conflict. What do we mean with pacifying? What do we mean with development? Those key words that we use all the time. And, and we say oh, we need, as Alexander said, we need a, a more holistic approach to, to this aspect of development. What do we mean as development here? What is real development? Can we, can we find examples in other parts of the world and similar conflicts that we managed to come with development and this development mean re really the solution of a conflict and really mean pacification, whatever we mean with this term, pacification. So I don't have an answer for that. And again, if I had an answer for what will be the future or probably solutions for this conflict, I would be in another role, not this one. But I think that, and being studying conflicts around the world, in, in not in Africa in particular, not in Mozambique in particular, but in Latin America that shares quite a lot of things in common with what we are seeing um, in, in Cabo Delgado as well. What I think is that we, we normally are very good in say that, yeah, we need development, we need pacification and let's pacify, or, but we don't know what's that, what that means. We don't know what we mean with that. We don't take into consideration the dynamics, the internal violent dynamics of communities that are not imposed by superpowers or by religion or by other things, but dynamics of communities that grow around violence as well. So what means to that? How we address violence if from inside communities? Is again a defense problem or is a security problem? If we don't clarify these points, Next year, we'll be talking this again, having this talk here and talking what's the next conflict and we will be repeating. We need the uh, development, we need pacification and we need to find a solution that is holistic and we need to do that with strong force. Again, we will just reinforce more. Next year, we have more troops. Next year, we, we have more technology involved on in that because the economy of this conflict is growing as well. As, as, as Lark said, there is an economy in conflict. There are lots of people that want this conflict to escalate. and and lots of groups, economic groups, and not only Mozambique. It's not only a problem of Mozambique governments and politicians. It is a lot of actors that really want that to happen, to increase this problem. So what we mean with this, that, these things, what we mean with defense or, or how we look at this conflict as defense or a security issue, what we mean with development, what we mean as pacification, and what is solution indeed? I don't think I come with any good answer for you here. I don't think I came with any good message to finish in this talk as the last one. But I think if we don't think carefully about that, we'll be repeating mistakes of previous conflicts that we have seen unsolved around the world and forgotten with the suffering of a lot of poor people, as Borges said, that are not here with us debating about their own future. And I stop here. we wait, I, I will make the use of the, 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 the floor again or the, the screen again, and as the last one. Um, and I think I would add another aspect here um, is this question of, um, of leadership and the question of um, leadership that is coming from the inside reality of the communities and not uh, coming from, from outside. Um, and for conflicts like the one we see in Cabo Delgado, um, if we import solutions, we will probably fall into the old mistakes of uh, recipes of uh, conflict prevention or conflict solutions that failed in the past. I think it's very important to start to encourage uh, the, the growing of leadership from inside those communities, from the communities that have been affected and allowing this leadership uh, to, to grow as a, as a sense of uh, ownership of the solutions for their own problems as well. Uh, it, is, it, it, it is impossible to really solve any sort of conflict if we come with an um, uh, uh, outsider solution for that, with uh, a mission from UN or African Union that will solve the problems there, or uh, a very good mission from the IMF or the, the World Bank or etc. because that's again, it is a very um, um, 
it's a very laboratorial solution, but it's not something that grow from inside the needs of these communities. Uh, it is its most important element. I probably even think more important than robust response. It's the support and the growing of local leadership, local leadership that can have some sort of ownership in the in the finding um, ways to address the, the the fragility of the region, the frictions that are happening around, and the way that they will address um, from from their perspective as well. Of course, as analysts, we we have this perspective that the broader perspective we can see probably aspects that local communities are not seeing. Uh, and especially this dynamic of global business and and the, 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 the dynamics of a global elements of security. But again, uh, it, it is it, without the participation of local population, we can forget we will not have solutions either. Bernardino, I just took the time that you were rejoining to complement what I was saying and entertain the people. If you get five minutes more, I will start to sing. Okay, uh, time is running. Um... And um, sorry, we have to finish for today. Uh, I would like to thank you, our invitations, our guest speakers for today, uh, Professor Vinicius, Professor Alexandra, uh, Professor Azlak and uh, Borges. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, we try to see an overview about the past, about the present and think a little bit about the future. Uh, it was very important, your comments. Uh, we hope to have in the next week uh, the video link and we can share with everybody in our Africa sections. And at the same time, we are uh, thinking to putting in place a, a, a sort of uh, letter when with, with the final conclusions of this uh, webinar. Um, so uh, the closing remarks um, for me now, I would like to thank you our partners, uh, Centro de Análise Estratégica da Cplp in Maputo, uh, o Centro de Estudos Internacionais do Instituto Universitário de Lisboa, um, and also our colleagues from the King's College, from the Nova University in Lisbon, from Shokishi uh, Sanu University in uh, Maputo, and thank you very much for the Mikael Institute in Bergen in Norway. So we keep looking for this problem and I would like to wish you also Merry Christmas for everybody, Happy New Year. And once again, uh, thank you very much for joining this evening. It was a very good discussion and I hope to see very soon in the next future, okay? Thank you very much for everybody and sorry some problems on the internet connection. But uh, I also would like to our colleagues Karina and Shayla for a very good work. And I hope to see you very soon in the next event on Africa sections. Bye.